Hello and welcome to the Synthetic Native Podcast. I am here today with a special guest, uh, David French. Did I get your name right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks You're, for having me. Pretty straightforward. Name. Yeah, it's a pretty. <laughs> yeah, the, the the last person I, I I butchered their name right at the beginning, so um, that was good. So David French, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself, but um, you are. Let me see if I can characterize you. You are a um, an artist and designer uh, with a history and kind of interaction design and also meddling in VR, XR affairs. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I'd say that's that's pretty accurate. I um, you can give give the long form version. Yeah, I mean, for the people. B- basically, uh, I uh, went to school for film. Uh, decided I wanted to go into video games. Uh, came to Austin in 2013 and uh, started doing stuff in the indie game community. Um, and that's around the time that the Oculus Rift came out. And then um, pretty much have been fiddling around, you know, uh, per, you know, uh, pretty active com- uh, member in the community here in Austin, uh, making stuff, going to game jams and hackathons and stuff. Um, I've uh, project championed a couple of projects, uh, VR projects at hackathons. Um, and uh, yeah, but, I mean, mostly just like focusing on... Uh, uh, VR and its applications in like education and civic technology is like basically my main focus. So, yeah, your 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 kind of uh, flagship, if we can call that so far, has been something called uh, Hackafrack. Yeah, it's right? It's basically Fruit Ninja. It's like you know we did that in like two days, but it's a Fruit Ninja but teaches fractions, um, kind of as a proof of concept of um, the idea of being able to uh, kinesthetically. Uh, teach abstract ideas so you know fractions is a nice very start easy starting place kind of thing so is, is that um is that a platform agnostic could you run it on a vibe or a, a rift or yeah so we built does it, it for, care yeah so we built it for uh vive using the steam vr unity plugin um but transferring between the oculus and the uh, vive is actually fairly easy um I'm only now, in many ways, like beginning my uh, education in development. Um, but my understanding is that the both the Vive and Oculus adhere to a open standard, um, which is the Open VR, Open Standard VR, OS VR, uh, which also includes uh, like the uh, the the Hydra. You know the the, the there was a uh, Razer. The people who make the Hydra, they have their own like. DK, you know, like development kit that I don't think very many people have it, but it's all it's all like these like open source versions of VR basically. So and they okay. and they adhere uh, Razor, to that. Razor Razor has its own VR uh, device. Um, I don't know if it's their own device or if they partnered with. Uh, I know that there is so OS VR is the open standards VR, um, and it's like a council, sort of in the same way that like the WW. Uh, C, you know, is in charge of like HTML and CSS. 3C, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh-huh. uh, it's uh, basically it's something similar to that uh, where it's a bunch of hardware manufacturers and developers and stuff uh, agreeing on a standard. And then the organization that did that, I believe, produced with Razer a open source, like, physical piece of hardware that is like, this is, there's the open source VR and then there's the OS VR headset it's an actual specific headset um but it's really just like uh, you know uh it's, you know it's just like a standardization for like the way that like the screens have to you know send information to like graphics cards and stuff so oh, okay so um can you talk a little bit about since you have some experience in kind of what i'm gonna call like i guess old school design just non-vr design that's all. Uh, that's all I'm saying. Like, is there a difference? Like, can you explain your approach when you're designing something in VR versus uh, maybe s- some other sort of thing for the web or whatever it may be? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, prior to uh, talking, uh, we kind of had a little bit of a conversation, uh, kind of touching on this, which is, I mean, I think the primary thing between uh, designing for one versus the other is that. Uh, other more traditional forms of interaction design are uh, have kind of like established metaphors and like ways of doing things. 
So unless you have like a really good reason, compelling reason to like do something differently, you probably aren't going to like, you know, stick your menu bar, you know, on the bottom of your page or something like that. Like things are navigation generally goes at the top, you know, buttons generally try to be as center as possible, you know, very like standard stuff. Um, with VR, it's a lot more of a creative process because there isn't established norms yet. Um, and there isn't even really an established hardware uh, in the sense that uh, interaction in the desktop is driven heavily by the use of keyboard and mouse. Um, but you don't have physical hard, you know, you're holding controllers, but you're using those to interact with interfaces or some kind of thing that could be anything, you know, it's just like a 3D, uh, you could have, you know, um, uh, thousands of buttons that like spring out of your hand or like uh, one of the most interesting uh, pieces of UI is, uh, and there's a GDC talk on this that's really good, but uh, the guy who, the lead developer who did Fantastic Contraption, which shipped with the Vive, did a GDC talk about interaction, uh, menu-less uh, interaction or UI. And uh, in their game, instead of having a menu system, they have like a little cat that like follows you around. And instead of, you know, pushing a button to call up a menu to your view, you like physically turn around in space, look at the cat and like wave at it and it like comes to you. So there's, a, it, it, I think a lot of it tends to, towards a lot of skeuomorphism because that's sort of obvious that VR is about uh, simulation for a lot of people, but uh, I don't think it's only bound by that. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's hard to comment more specifically because I think, I mean, every project is going to be different. It really is a matter of just like trying to mm -hmm. figure out like what's the thing we're trying to do and like how do we do that with as little, <laughs> as little like custom, you know, uh, like, com you know, complexity added to it than, than necessary. So. Right. So some of that speaks to the fact that VR as a medium can just do so many different things and you might be trying to do something very, very, very immersive and very, in essence, very skeuomorphic, or you might be trying to do something, maybe it's like just web, like a web page, and it's not that different than, uh, um, you know, what you would do normally on the web, uh, like fill out forms or whatever. I actually just got an Oculus. I haven't done a lot of really anything yet, um, but I, I wonder, I don't think I've, I've done any typing, actually. Um, it's kind of a good time to bring this up, I guess. Uh, what, how do you handle sort of more basic things like like typing yeah, so, uh, in VR? So that that's kind of a problem. Um, actually, one of the projects that um, I have been working on with Adam uh, in our art collective Verve um, is uh, uh, trying to, uh, I think the best version of this, like the best like naming convention someone came up for it was Koozie VR, which is that like, Currently, we can track objects in VR uh, using these big pucks um, for Steam. I mean, for the you know for HTC Vive, um, uh, but they're they're really really big. They're very accurate, but they're like huge. And so we've been actually like prototyping like little small sensors that are like way less accurate because they only have like one or two photodiodes instead of having like thirty. Um, but the purpose of it would be is like placing it on your keyboard or on a mouse so that you can see it in VR. Um, or the reason why it's called QZ mm. VR is because like, if you put it on a QZ with your drink. Um, but the, but the, I mean, the, at this time, you know, without that, like that kind of hardware uh, ease, uh, the way uh, to deal with typing is to not do it <laughs> pretty much. Um, a lot of okay. Hold on, back up just a second. What is Koozie VR? Who came up with? Uh, is that something that exists already, and you used it in your project, or it's it's something that we're working on uh, internally in in Verve. Um, it's a it's a much bigger hardware issue than I originally thought. Um, the 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 name Koozie VR is is really actually for a separate project that a friend who I brought in to help us with this project. Basically, he, he he's a very smart engineer, and we were having a little bit of difficulty with some of the math, and we were like, "Hey, mm -hmm. can you help us with this thing we're working on with custom tracked objects?" Um, we had like you know gone on the internet and bought like from the original manufacturer the photodiodes and stuff, 
Um, and he was like, oh, yeah, I'm basically doing the same thing. Um, except he was trying to make a koozie and we're trying to make a general use micro uh, like tracker. So like something small that you could put on a koozie, that you could put on your keyboard, you could put on your mouse. Um, but yeah, that that's basically the idea there. And then and then outside. So you so you can make. Let me make sure I understand. Mm -hmm. So you can make. So it's so essentially, if you had to use your mouse or your keyboard or not knock over your drink, whatever it may be, uh, so you can see those objects in the virtual environment. Right. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and uh, okay. And it, it's a uh, yeah. It's it's a, it's a it's a pretty big problem. Um, and outside of like a hardware solution like that, uh, VR is. I mean, there are people who use it for typing, um, but it's pretty bad. it's pretty bad. It's pretty hard to do. Um, and there's mm -hmm. some interesting ways that people get around it. Uh, Unity um, has a I don't know if it's in their 2017 build yet, uh, but they have at least a beta that they showed off that allows you to use the Unity uh, editor, a uh, scene editor inside VR. And they have some pretty interesting typing solutions there. Um, they have like they they make it like a tom tom, uh, where you kind of like, da, 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 and then if you like point onto it, it automatically changes up into like a little po like a board that you're poking, um, which is pretty smart. They okay. have some neat stuff, but like generally, it's like not I you know I wouldn't recommend being in that position which you ha have to or that your user is so, gonna have to. So, t so typing is almost not even a solved problem. Really? Yeah, it's it's uh it's definitely like a pretty big issue still, and um, so yeah, I mean who knows like how that's gonna go? I think a lot of it's gonna honestly get, I think a lot of that's gonna be maybe solved by hardware because we're looking at more and more computer vision based tracking, and it wouldn't surprise mm -hmm. me if like, you know, in the next like two years we have uh, an entirely computer based you know vision based tracking that is so good with tracking hands that you can just like type in in like on the on like your table or something it would it would like feel right or you can type on an actual right. keyboard or, you know like you know that that stuff is like progressing so quickly like i have no clue you know where that's going to be i think that hardware innovation is going to outstrip the design and software innovation right now right another thing to consider is like for things that aren't like passwords for example, if you're in the company of other people, um, voice interface might somewhat make up for some of this, but they're, at least in my experience, voice interfaces are like really, really good at some subset of things, uh, but still kind of, there's a lot of holes in them, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I use, I use Google, uh, Google Assistant, and uh, other than that, uh -huh. like I never... I only used it in the car. I, um, I've never gotten used to like talking to my Xbox or to like, a, you know, a PS4 or something like that. Um, or like an Alexa. So I think, I think that's somewhat of an like path, but I think, I think in some ways it's the things in which the having a voice assist, I mean, a voice, like a voice thing command would be, uh, useful for are the kinds of things that are already pretty easy to do in VR. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the things that like voice is not good at, like long paragraphs of text. Uh, that is like the thing that people want to be able to do in VR or like, you know, even just being able to like move a cursor around or kind of like get a sense of like copying and pasting or using hotkeys or that kind of thing. Like that isn't really stuff you can do, you know, with voice very well. Yeah. I have, I have a Google Home and I just find myself using it for some like very small subset of things like play music, turn off the lights, and that's it. So, but web VR is starting to get kind of more of a push, and um, it's unclear to me exactly what that looks like. Like it seems to me that you would only really want to do web VR um, if you're doing these very like bespoke web experiences, um, rather than kind of use it as your web browser. But I don't I don't know. But my point is, is that like, imagine sitting in front of your computer and doing all the things that you normally do on the web, uh, but you have to do them all with your voice. Like that doesn't seem like a great solution. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that exactly. Yeah. I'm just, it just seems like a, a big struggle. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a big struggle. And I think, I hope it's one that like gets, you know, worked on soon because 
I actually think that one of the things that's like going to be really cool is when programming IDEs can be in VR. There's been a couple like small things that people have done, but as someone who's like interested in technology and VR and education, I would love for there to be like a way of teaching people, you know, programming by like physically plugging in, like, here's a little piece of code. Here's like a little node. You type your little bit of code and, and you physically plug it into another piece of code or like, you know, you're physically creating loops. Like I think, you know, kids, kids learn programming through playing Minecraft and using the red, you know, redstone switch or whatever. And like, I think that would be amazing. Yeah. That kind of basic, like we can teach kids any, you know, like any kind of like these abstract concepts that are actually really useful. Yeah. Yeah. People are pretty much visual. Like, I don't know if you've heard about this, but, um, I was told at least, or at least I read that, um, th there's kind of a myth about people having like different learning styles. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I I'm not saying that it's like totally false. Mm -hmm. Um, but as somebody who's interested in education, maybe you have some insight into this, uh, that pretty much we're all like, I mean, most people like our strongest sense is, is visual, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there was an analogy to like uh, processing power and it was comparing like, um, you know, uh, uh, like smell is like one kilobyte per second mm -hmm. and then like touch is like 10 megabytes per second and then a sight is like a gigabyte per second or something like yeah. sight is like an order of magnitude greater than all your other senses in terms of like how much information it can actually yeah process there, there there's I, I, so. I think i remember reading a comparison of, of of dog brains and human brains and like dog brains like have a massive part of their brain is dedicated to smell and like humans have like nothing but like we like we have like so much more with visual for of, of, of almost any other animal pretty much so but yeah i definitely right so that's I was going to say that's just kind of the excitement i yeah. guess around yeah so, so we, can, we can kind of transition here into like the vr education thing like the reason is is uh, that it's exciting is that you can get this crazy, uh, not just higher fidelity experience, but also um, it's almost beyond high fidelity. It's just you can you can create experiences that um, visualize things in in a in the most optimal way potentially for somebody to learn a concept, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's that, and it's also I think the fact that like it scales really well, uh, you know, like education through technology is, uh, is, is, you know, you can have a really amazing teacher, um, but if you have a really, really good lecturer on YouTube, like that can oftentimes like go so much farther and hit so many more people. And VR is like taking that principle of like the scalability of technology and like making it accessible in a way uh, and free in a way that like, it's kind of hard to do with a 2D screen um, there's, it's, you know, kind of, there's only so much you can do trying to get people to, you know, click inside of a, you know, a window and, and select how many, how much they think two plus two is, you know, that's it's just, there's just not as much stuff to do there. You know? Oh, you're just saying it's not as immersive. It's not as engaging. Well, it's not as engaging, but I think it's also that like, I think it's that there are like. There, there, there are issues of the level of, like, uh, information you get per, like, square inch of, like, time, like effort. Okay, so, so one way to put this is like this. One of the absolute best VR experiences, in my opinion, is Accounting VR uh, by Justin Roiland, uh, creator of Rick and Morty. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, uh, it is fucking dead simple to build. It is... Uh, it is just, you know, a series of, like, very low-fidelity characters, not animated um, that much. Um, and all of the experience of it is through the framing of the way a story is told. Um, if you want to make something that had, like, that much impact inside of a 2D experience, um, you would have to spend a lot more money. Just the asset creation requirements would be just, like, huge. Um, because partially because we're like used to that um, and we're not used to VR, but I think it's also because uh, there is a, uh, 
an immediacy to the experience. I mean, you, people call it immersion. I guess like what I am getting at is immersion, but it's I kind of think of it as like more than just immersion because immersion to me sort of implies uh, simulation or like a focus on trying to make a person feel like they're physically in a place. And I sort of sure I sort of like see this as more of like the ability to communicate an idea that otherwise would feel abstract in a way that feels concrete. Um, okay, okay, but hold on, hold on. You Because you mentioned this accounting VR thing, and I think you kind of glazed over, or maybe I just missed, like, what does it actually do? Uh, that's a little bit hard to explain, but it's basically a, uh, a story. It's like a 15-minute story that you travel through. Um, and the reason why I use it as an Okay, example, so it's a cinematic experience? Sort of. It's hard to say it's cinematic. If you've ever played Stanley Parable, it's kind of like that. Um, it's actually made okay, by I William Pugh, uh, one of the guys who uh, made Stanley Parable. Um, so it, 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 it's sort of like people call them di- uh, kind of like as a pejorative uh, walking simulators. It has elements of that mm-hmm. where it's like these games that are like not really games. They're more like environments with like not necessarily a story, but like have an experience that's like involved. But it's very funny. It's very, you know, uh, interesting. Mm-hmm. It's just... Because it's Justin Roiland and Stanley Parable guy? Yes, yeah. Uh, okay. William Pugh uh, it, did the programming, uh, like design and stuff, and Justin Roiland basically did all the writing, I think. So. Okay, okay. Cool. Yeah, we actually just recently had um, Seattle International Film Festival up here, and uh, there was um, a whole sort of section just dedicated to um, cinematic VR experiences and um, I don't know. Uh, it kind of sounds like it would fall under that category, well, maybe. Well, actually, that's that, that's uh, probably the reason why I, I didn't want to call it cinematic is because it's uh-huh. very, very different from those kinds of experiences. So I I've, I've done a little bit of VR, like like volunteering for like VR film stuff here in Austin, and that stuff comes out of a very different, I think, uh, culture and mindset than. Uh, the stuff that Justin Roiland and uh, Stanley Parable, uh, you know, William are, are, are doing, because that stuff comes out of natively out of interaction. Um, and I think mm-hmm. a lot of the cinematic VR stuff is really either essentially just, you know, 360 stereoscopic cameras that are mm-hmm. placed in locations to capture information. And then like they use, they use a VR helmet as like, a way of conveying that to your eyes but there's nothing like really fundamentally mm-hmm. like about the medium that it, it is defined by or arising from other than the fact that like it can't do cuts and stuff or a lot of the stuff is like on rails experiences that are like uh you know really really cool looking but essentially it's like uh coming out of like the tradition of a theme park ride or an amusement park ride where it's right. like pirates of the caribbean like you're on this little boat that's going through the water um, which is very, very different from like the sort of, uh, it's not non-linear per se, but through the sort of like, uh, like degree of, of like, of, of feeling of non-linearity that a walking simulator or like a, uh, you know, Stanley Parable type thing would have. Those things are much more... Okay, okay, I, I get it. I get it. There's, like, almost, like, a higher level of interactivity in a way. But yeah. I, let me just tell you one of the experiences I had, and you can kind of tell me yeah. how it, how close it is or how far it is from what you're talking about, which is... Um, I'm going to butcher it a little bit because I don't even remember the name, but it, I think it won, actually, Best, best VR Film at uh, South by Southwest or something. And it, what it was was just a short, like, 10-minute story of um what it's like to basically be a prisoner and you'd be standing in this room and it would uh i forgot what the i want to say that the guy maybe went to prison maybe wrongfully or he um uh anyway all like i'm not trying to play down this guy's story i'm just i don't want to make it sound stupid but you were like kind of meant to feel sorry for the for the for the guy right and so Oh, okay. I remember. It was highlighting sort of how horrible um, solitary confinement is. And so you would spend some time like in the solitary confinement chamber, and then it would take you to kind of where he was after he got out. Um, 
in his like in his small room that he lived in after he was released and in a sense like you could kind of walk around the room you could kind of like it was a virtual environment so you could and, and he would be like appearing in in one part uh and then like standing up and then appearing in another part of the room so you weren't really interacting and you weren't even really walking but things were just happening around you and you were changing uh to different scenes and so that would not fall under this like walking simulator that you speak of yeah yeah i mean i think the 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 division between the two i mean that's probably pretty similar in a lot of ways uh to the kind of like walking simulator type thing um i think that the 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 distinction is is largely like a cultural one um in the same way that like you know the difference between like punk and metal is like has to do kind of you know there's intertwined parts but there's like stuff that has to do with like the history of like who influenced who and that kind of thing and so walking simulators and, and or, or ex, you know, that kind of thing uh, is sort of like, uh, there, there's certain like qualities about it that like uh, make it feel different because it, it's coming out of like a very specific set of like experiences or like uh, in influences. Um, but there are definitely like a lot of similarities there, uh, particularly like I think in the fact that, you know, uh, you know, walking simulators and cinematic experiences in VR are very much about, you know, atmosphere and establishing a location um, and and basically, like, giving you... They're not as, like, uh, in-point defined in the way that, like, games are. Games have, like, you a win state, a lose state, like, you know you do something right or wrong. You're trying to, you know, save the princess. You're trying to kill the bad guys, that kind of thing. So there's, yeah. there's definitely a yeah. lot of similarity there. So, so okay. Um... So let's think a little bit about what we've covered. Okay, so are there – I'm trying to think of different categories of VR experiences, and you tell me if I miss any. So we've got like – we've got games. We've got um, cinematic. We've got kind of this middle ground thing, kind of like a walking simulator, maybe like a – just a more passive gaming experience, which is probably on the spectrum between cinematic and and like a true game. game. Um, uh, we've got – this idea of um, sort of business VR, which might encompass things like, um, uh, you know, people designing things like for manufacturing and things like this. I'm sure you've heard of this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like um, kind of being able to get a high fidelity sort of VR um, version of like some architecture or like of a product so that you can obviously not go and build it, but just view it inside of VR and then kind of think about it that way, uh, which I think is in the really, really, really early stages, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Um, are there any other sort of VR types of VR experiences that you can think of that are, that are interesting? Yeah. So, I mean, my, my, one of the things I'm primarily interested in is, uh, so in this sort of like, uh, overlaps a little bit with the last category you mentioned, um, but like applications, um, and I, the applications that are used for like mocking up, you know, business ventures or like architecture and stuff, like would, I think ultimately derive from this more general category of like tools that you use in VR, like things you actually make, you know? Um, so like, I, I, uh, you know, I, I'm like very into like using Oculus medium. Um, I, uh, it's a, uh, modeling um, sculpting kind of thing. It's almost like ZBrush in a way. Um, uh, I, I also have done uh, Quill, uh, and which is kind of like a sort of like a more advanced version kind of a tilt brush, which you probably know tilt brush. Um, but like, I'm very interested, yeah. I guess, I guess the thing to say there is like, I'm very interested in art applications or like things that people are making to build things for VR in VR or build things for like not in VR in in VR, you know, like just like the ability to like, uh, you know, walk around, you know, a, a, an architect can show their work, but also an architect can like design their work inside of VR also. And that sort of thing's like the, right. the biggest, I think, field of interest to me um, right now. So, so like, like actual like tool sets and, and uh, I guess like the, the, the equivalent of your Adobe Creative Cloud and any number of other things, but I think that's a really good example of, t of imagine having all that power but leveraging the abilities of like a VR right yeah exactly and and I also like like related to that I think that 
and we have yet to like see this. We see some like little inklings of it on the you know peripheries of, of VR right now. Um, but I really am interested in seeing how a from the bottom up, um, or at least like highly integrated VR experiences on the operating system level. Because right now we have applications that run inside of a computer that uh, if you don't have a screen for it, you can't do anything with it. But like, I think, you know, in the future we will be seeing more and more, uh, you know, a little block, a, a little box that sits on your, you know, your desk or whatever, or, you know, in the case of maybe like mobile VR, but if that like picks up enough, uh, the, the power for it does, um, that you just like, you know, put on your goggles and, and you're in the operating system right there. And I think that sort of thing, the, the sort of like in some ways kind of boring aspects of VR, the how do you integrate your interactions between programs? You know, uh, Windows has been the dominant metaphor for desktops for the past, you know, before I was born. Um, and like, mm -hmm. how do you switch between programs in VR on an operating system that's built for VR? It's going to be like, Kind of weird. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work yet, but I'm, I'm. That's the thing I'm really fascinated in seeing is like more of that kind of like low level kind of like, you know, boring. That fundamental stuff yeah. that is that is really gonna gonna increase adoption, right? And yeah. Just just make it easier to develop. Yeah, because for an established paradigm. Yeah, because a lot of what we have right now it still feels very much like tech demos and and like interesting things or, or cute you know you know games or whatever, but they're you know, it's hard to it's hard to get work done when you're like, you know, can't switch between a program without taking off a you know, helmet. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and obviously, people are trying to solve this problem. Yeah. Oculus mm -hmm. and everybody else th thinks that they're solving this problem. It's just it remains to be seen what will actually become the right. the standard, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, so, just uh, I want to quickly cover AR. Um, we've been like one thing that's been happening a lot lately is. What I really want to say is XR because what I'm really talking about is all things on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, but VR is just so much more like the, the term is so much more um, – the adoption is, is much higher. Mm -hmm. If I said XR, I think some people would be like, oh, you mean like any type of augmented reality thing? And I'd be like, yeah. Um, but my, my point anyway is, is we've been kind of leaving out AR out of the conversation. Is there anything that, that's important about that that, um, that we should have – talked about in your opinion yeah i mean uh i i don't know i i could be extremely arrogant and i might be like sharing an opinion that just comes out of uh, me thinking i know something i don't um but despite the fact that a lot of people are saying ar is going to hit big before vr uh i'm pretty skeptical of that because uh i really think the thing that's going to help ar get through is when we have light field display technology and right now the like hard limitations of how much processing power and GPU that takes is absolutely absurd. Um, and the display mm -hmm. technology for it is also extremely expensive and complicated. Um, and so I think a lot of times when people say, Oh, AR is going to be the next thing, you know, it's like, uh, well, you know, I mean, there's a reason why Apple did AR kit as a, uh, you know, a thing inside of their phone and not as a separate device. And that's because the display technology and the, like the, the, the real, like the really big hurdle, I think for like getting people to use AR consistently is, is like still technologically a huge undertaking. So, um, okay. Well, I did hear today and I don't know if this is old news or not, but I heard that, uh, AR kit is actually kind of, um, uh, baby steps towards an eventual, uh, mixed reality product like headset that uh, mm -hmm. Apple will be releasing down the line like three years from now or something yeah, like that. Yeah, they acquired uh, uh, a, a display, uh, AR display company a couple months ago. So, Okay, that makes sense. So um, could you, if you, un if you have a good grasp of it, could you quickly explain kind of what AR is, but AR kit is? Because I'm not sure that I understand it. Maybe, may, like as far as I'm concerned, it's just a, toolkit for developing AR applications that Apple's releasing. Um, so I don't have a very nuanced understanding of it. it can you yeah. expand on that? So, I mean, it's, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not like a, a, you know, the best developer and stuff. So I'm sure I'm going to get some technical aspect of this wrong, but essentially, uh, for the longest time, 
uh, VR and AR has been using uh, outside in tracking technology, uh, which basically means that like with the Vive, you have lighthouses um, and then you are getting an absolute position. Uh, so probably should back up. Okay. So the, 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 basically the minimum, what people really, really want with VR and AR is six degrees of freedom. So they want X, Y, Z, and then roll yaw and pitch. So you have the ability to track all three dimensional space accurately. Uh, the traditional way of doing that in VR is to have something outside of the headset, either tracking the person, which is what Oculus does with the cameras, or is setting some kind of like uh, reliable, absolute uh, marker that can be used to track in space. So the way the Vive does that is with a laser grid that it shoots out um, out of the lighthouses. Um, Inside Out is different in that it uses computer algorithms and AI to do object recognition, surface recognition, imply depth of field and stuff um, from, from just like a, a video feed in the same way that your eyes do and your brain allows you to know like how far away something is. Um, and then that can be used right. to track a person through 3d space, um, to do, you know, a VR thing if they have a headset on and, it, but it can also be used to like integrate, uh, you know, 3d models or like augmented, you know, material into the, into that, you know, scene, um, which is like pretty fucking crazy. Uh, like, the fact that AR kit is able to do what it does with a monocular lens is like insane. I just like literally like a month or two before they announced AR kit, I saw, you know, uh, this company called, uh, since one, I think they have a, they have like a, basically a computer vision based, uh, tracking, uh, you know, camera that you have to buy. It's like $500, but it's like, oh, it's amazing. It can track in 3D space, three, six, you know, uh, six degrees of freedom. Um, and, and AR, you know, basically AR kits, it's doing that, but without all the hardware, extra hardware needed. Um, and they do that purely basically by like having a really, really smart AI, uh, essentially, like just training it to understand computer vision and, and be able to see things. So... So it's like a really strong like inside out rather than outside in paradigm yeah. for the detection. That's cool. Uh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I need to go study up on my AR kit. Um, so it sounds like that could be hours more conversation just by itself. Yeah. Um, we're kind of ending the near that nearing the end of our time here. Um, so uh, is there anything in particular you're excited about for VR going forward? Like what's the most exciting thing for you? Hmm. There's a, there's a project in, uh, in, uh, Maya that some guys in Japan are doing called, uh, uh, M A R U I. Um, and it's a modeling and animation suite plugin built for VR for Maya. Um, and I'm pretty excited about that just because, um, animation, like, you know, it's one of those things that's like still not very, you know, a lot of people can draw, you know, but like 3D animation is still kind of like a mysterious thing that Pixar and DreamWorks does for a lot of people. Um, and I think yep. that that is that whole process is, you know, of, of using tracking technology and using, uh, you know, VR and AR is going to start like bleeding more and more of that kind of like. Uh, traditional 2D interface and 3D interface experience together, I think, because we'll start having, you know, more people used to the idea that their computer is not, their interface is not contained within just the screen. It's something that, like, they can actually, like, move their arms around in or some, you know, to direct, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, interface, basically, so... Right, right, right. Okay, that sounds cool. So M A R U I. Okay, David. So, um, can you let the people out there know if you want to? I don't know what your social media presence is like, but if you have one, how can people uh, uh, follow you or get in touch with you? Yeah. Uh, so I'm currently rebooting my website, but I can be found uh, yelling into the American void on Twitter, uh, and my uh, uh, my at for that is uh, T H E. 
D O N Q U I X O T I C, the Don Quixotic. Uh, I got it in 2008 when I was in high school and probably should have picked something easier to spell. <laughs> so. Uh, there's a lot of like Q's and X's in yeah. there. So, well, one each, but that's a lot. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well. So, yeah. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate you coming on the podcast. All right. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Um, if you enjoyed that and you want to hear more uh, XR and advanced user interface technology content, then please go on Facebook and like us under Synthetic Native or go on YouTube and subscribe to us, which would be even better under Synthetic Native. Uh, we're also on, on Twitter. So follow us on all of those or any of those that you use. And uh, please let me know what you think. Uh, did you like it? Did you not like it? Are there any topics you'd like to see covered? I would really, really appreciate it. And yeah, thanks again so much for listening.